So now someone's going to ask a question, is that right? to put into words that are meaningful and only glorify God and please God. Uh, my father was uh, only saved when he was 51 and he lived for nine years and he literally turned the world upside down, his world. That's the only person I think I can honestly say those words of. Uh, in the nine years he lived. My mother uh, was staggered by my brother's transformed life when he gave his life to Christ. He was a very um, heavy drinking, smoking all day and uh, not a very lovely character. That would be everybody's opinion. My brother's salvation shook my mother, shook me. I came to Christ because of my brother's transformation. I wanted God desperately to save my soul before I heard the gospel from a pulpit, just through a life. And that shook my mother and my father. And then I came to Christ and the transformation of my brother and I shook both our parents, and then my daddy came to Christ. My father was so changed uh, that there's no way you could ever comprehend or I could ever relay how he changed. It's beyond belief. My mother went out into the gardens, um, and I came home from preaching somewhere. I was a young preacher. And my nanny, a uh, Basutu lady, a black, lovely, wonderful Basutu lady. Uh, she was my mother's best friend, there's no doubt of that. Mother loved her. And uh, they survived a lot together through the unsaved days. But nanny, my uh, nanny said, uh, you have to go now and find your mommy because uh, she's crying and she's weeping. And she started to weep because she loved my mother. I said, but why? She said, I don't know. Your mother just doesn't want to be in the house. She doesn't want to be with your father or me. She just goes out in the gardens and we see if I try and find her. So I went out to find my mother. And there she was, weeping, all alone, sitting somewhere in our gardens of our home. So I said, Mommy, you wept most of my life in sorrow, but we're all saved and changed and daddy's changed. And you, why would you weep now? What, what, what would you weep at? So she looked at me for a while, just dead silence, and she shook me. I never really quite recovered by what my mother said. Uh, your daddy. She says, I never had another man. He was my childhood sweetheart. I never, ever, ever loved another man. And I know your daddy. But since this salvation, 
He is so changed, Keith, that I don't know him. It's like a total stranger has come into my life. He's so changed. I don't know what to say to him. I know nothing about this man. He is so changed, he's another person living in my home. And I don't know what to do to sit with him, to, to just... It's like a total stranger is in my home that I don't know anything about. I'm scared to sit with him. I'm scared to be near him. And then she wept a bit. She said, I, I just looked at him tonight and I said, who is this man? Who is this man? I just had to flee the home. So I said, mommy, It's Jesus. So she was very startled. She said, what? I said, it's Christ in Daddy that you're looking at. It's not just a changed man. Salvation is Christ in you. We are predestined. That's before the foundations of the world. God knowing in his foreknowledge the fall. Not one to heaven, one to hell, but to be conformed back into the image of God. And Jesus Christ is the image of God. The Bible says he is the one that is being conformed. It's not an immediate, it's a present continuous tense, that word. And what you see now, you're going to see more and more of Jesus. Daddy, the old man... That's gone. It, it, what remains of it is going to become less and less as Daddy seeks God. It's Christ you, you, you're with now in that home. Christ in Daddy. Living out his life through Daddy. Actually, there's nothing more obnoxious in Christianity in the entire world. There's nothing more horrible than someone who professes to belong to Christ who is not Christ-like. Christianity becomes an obnoxious religion if it doesn't reveal Jesus Christ. And that is what happened when he got saved. There's no doubt, not one year later, but when he got up from his knees, he walked out there so changed that that night, everyone from that night, from that prayer, was staggered. My mother was staggered to silence. She couldn't speak for days. She just couldn't believe that in one prayer, one moment, a man could stand up. So, to, And he became more and more. Now, there's this verse. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow. Grow what? In stature? No. Spiritually, yes, but ultimately, in the light of all scriptures, into more Christ-likeness. That's the whole concept of what God's doing, of what God begins when you get on your knees. The divine nature is imparted. The old nature is given a death blow to such a degree. And as you allow yourself to grow into more Christ-likeness. Of course, Daddy did. He read through the Bible from that night till the day he died, which was nine years of life as a Christian. He read 68 times from cover to cover. I never knew anyone that wept his way through the Bible as my father. Others have read through the Bible but I only know one man I can say is wept. He wept through the Bible. It was like every page just broke his heart to know that God is saying this. He went 68 times through this book and he read through every commentary that was of any worth. Uh, Matthew Henry, Adam Clark, IVP. Every page is marked. Every page is summarized. Pages in between the pages of the whole commentary. I don't know how that's possible. All the books 
that are genuinely from Pilgrim's Progress to all of Andrew Murray's books, things of depth, not the shallow books that you get that don't bring any depth. That's why you've got to be real to even be able to read past the first page of Andrew Murray. But every book that matters to, to those who go deep with God, Daddy had them all, and he read through every single page. He devoured the things of God. He devoured this book above everything. And I believe this book, to the degree you devour it, it devours you. To the degree you allow yourself to be disciplined enough to devour this book as the greatest discipline in life. My father did that. To that degree you grow. And he left everybody behind in the dust. Preachers, great preachers, wept in his presence. People who knew him, like you were mentioning now, who did not like my daddy because he was a ruthless man in the business world and a lot of people crawled. if they didn't live up to what he... But when they saw the change from some of the wealthiest people in my country's history uh, to many others who walked away hating him, when they sat and looked at him and listened to him and saw him, and they just couldn't recover. They just turned to God. Everywhere. Just gave their lives to Christ. You can argue with a message, tragically, even if it's God's word that a man faithfully brings, but you cannot argue with a life. In our homes, you might not be able to get them to hear a sermon, to get them to the church, even if a great preacher comes. But that doesn't matter because a life lived out the gospel lived out is as powerful, if not more powerful, beginning in the home and then to everybody that knew you. That transformation that God says must happen if you are in Christ, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things. That's a staggering statement. All things are become new. If if any man, any person be in Christ, is saved. That happened. We saw it. They saw it in us. We saw it in Daddy. And my mother was the one who first really said, Who is this man? And then multitudes said the same thing. Who is this man that knew him for years and feared him and many hated him? I never saw a greater miracle in my life and God knows I mean it than the miracle of my father's salvation. I have seen miracles that I never knew God would in mercy perform when we prayed for incredibly sick people who were healed on that moment. That shook communities. It shook me more than anyone else that God actually answered this prayer. But that's not a miracle of worth. Above the worth of a miracle of a changed life. A life that so changes that everyone in this world that knows you is staggered and drawn to give their lives to Christ. That to me is a greater miracle. And of course, the mark of his life as the result of what God did was souls. There was not a soul in his life that came near him not one single person that daddy didn't plead with and beg and weep with. 
he walked down the street in our town and mother told me later that she was walking down the street and she saw him and she was so ashamed because she wasn't saved because he was standing there weeping with people who just stood around him in the street of the city of the town begging them to take these checks come to Christ and she said she, she just walked the other across the street to avoid being recognized as his wife every time you saw daddy outside of the home or the room with God he was weeping with a soul and there was a very great preacher in our country they called him the Billy Graham of South Africa for many many years he was the most loved preacher but daddy was sitting in a meeting with us when we were all first saved and uh, well a few years into salvation and this very very great preacher stopped the meeting he was preaching to an enormous auditorium and he said I can't preach any further this sermon and with tears coming down his eyes he shook that auditorium he just pointed to my daddy Mr. Jack Daniels is in this meeting and then he said I can only say these words of one man in this world that I can honestly say this I don't know of another soul that I can say these words of it's like every step this man takes in life draws people to seek God desperately and immediately to save them and then he looked up and he said now why is that does God not want that of you? Can we believe that God only wants that of one man? Why are we not all like this? If God can do that for this man that across this nation people know of him, talk of him everywhere. What is wrong with us? That, that can't be said of us all. He closed his message there, which shook that convention. I suppose to the degree you give your soul to God when you seek him in such a way that God and heaven stand in awe and wonder, that heaven is obliged to come to that man and give him such a transformed life that they'll stagger the powers of hell the way he sought God and then as God watched him soaking himself in the one book that makes you everything God wants and expects of you to the degree you soak yourself in this book to that degree you walk with God in this world to such a degree that there's not a soul left in the end that doesn't think of that when they come near you long enough when he died they put on his tombstone that the businessmen erected there on his grave he walked with God I've never seen that in a grave I've seen all sorts of lovely scriptures and that are obviously the man but he walked with God mm. so I said to my mother daddy's life demanded that that be written on his gravestone it demanded of this world to write that of him And many, 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 many people found Christ. Just being near him, they just came to God. No argument. I am, of course, looking forward to seeing Christ more than anything in life. There's nothing that could come near. To see him face to face, to see the Savior that died for me face to face, I don't think there could be anything more wonderful in eternity for me. 
But I have said to God, and I know I'm not grieving God, I can't wait to see my father. I think I've said it daily since he died. I can't wait to see my daddy again. I so loved him for letting God make him what he became. Oh, so now, that was your question. I hope answered in a way that God is not grieved. Is there any other question here tonight? I believe the word predestination is in the Bible. Uh, chapters hinge on that word. <clears throat> but if you take an isolated chapter or an isolated verse, you can come up with a terrific error, including on predestination. You can blame God for men going to hell. That they had no choice because before the foundations of the world, God predestined them. Now many preachers, because of what we call hyper-Calvinism, because John Calvin was the first one after the Reformation, uh, of course Augustine, Luther themselves, they had strong leanings on those texts, but nothing like John, John Calvin. So it's called Calvinism. <clears throat> but a man... Jacobus Arminius, okay, a Dutchman, he counteracted uh, Calvin's teachings with the, uh, the five points of Cal. Of he ch challenged what Calvin and people believe about God being um, about election. In other words, elected one to heaven, you go to hell. Now you can stand on your head. You can do double somersaults. You can crawl on glass and weep and be covered in blood to see God to save you. There's nothing you can do to save you. You've been predestined to go to hell. You're going to hell. So there's no choice. So you don't make appeals. It can get to that extreme where you make God a monster. If you boil it down, he gave us a conscience. How can he not have one of right and wrong? Hmm. So, you've got to search the Bible. When I was a student, one of our lecturers, strong Calvinist, made some statements about election, predestination, and the free will of man, there's no such a thing. No such a thing. Not to him that willeth, but to God. It's, it's not our will that matters. He quoted scriptures. So, of course, I stopped him. <sighs> I was just a student. I never really stood in a pulpit of any worth. I stood in street corners crying out, but I stood up and I challenged him in that lecture room in such a way that he was shaken to the core. He was so visibly moved that I challenged him, weeping. I just started weeping. I said, God, you... You can't tell me that my God is sending people to hell. Not giving them a choice, it's his choice to punish someone for eternity because he decided that's the good pleasure of God. Nothing to do with them. All the students were visibly upset. The whole place just crumbled. And I challenge this, you just do not do that in a seminar. And uh, so he shouted at me, but he was trembling, his little lips and his eyes just wore moist at my brokenness, at the thought that God could do that. He said, don't you dare challenge me, young man. You get up and go to your room and open the Bible of Romans 9. 
and you read it prayerfully and you talk to God about it. Then you come back here and dare to challenge me publicly. So I went and read Romans 9 on my knees and I was deeply staggered. But I'm glad he did it. Because that set me off on what God wanted me to do. To study this book. Not just to say I'm getting through anymore. God, give me answers. And I went to different godly people. Some of them household names across southern across Africa. One man, I said, this man did that. Well, actually, they called me and said, did you do this in the lecture room? So I explained. Well done, boy. <laughs> Captain Dobby did. And so they all gave me all their answers of lifetime research. And I thank God that I didn't just want to study a doctrine that's controversial. I wanted to study to survive mentally, for my faith to survive, and for my defense in my conscience, in my heart, and to the world of God's integrity and righteousness in his judgment of each man. No man will stand before God and say, I had no choice, trust me. And so I, over many, many years, studied and found out one of the first answers. You do not take an isolated verse and say, that's my doctrine. You're in trouble. Because both, most people are total heretics to take isolated verses or isolated passages. You take 1 John 3. It says literally in the Greek, you can't change it, you can argue and say, it says he that continually sins cannot be of God, but it's not. The literal Greek, there's no doubt of this, because I was in one big debate with people that were far more educated, uh, says, uh, he that is born of God doth not commit sin, because he is born of God. He cannot sin. He that sinneth is of the devil. Whoa, you've got about 12 verses there that are staggering in 1 John 3. So you take that passage and say, oh, if you're born of God, you cannot sin. But that's heresy, because then I, in my all my studying and being with godly people, there's two places in the same letter of 1 John. That's why you've got to start in chapter 1, verse 1, before you get to chapter 3. And you find in chapter 2 and chapter 5, verse 11, verse 10, chapter 2, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah. If any man, Christian, sin, my little children, these things write down to you that you sin not. That's what we preach. Otherwise, what have we got to preach? But if... Not whenever, just carrying on a sin. Then you're in trouble. That's what 1 John 3 is about. If there's no repentance, no change, no turning from the broad road to the narrow, if God hasn't set you free, because if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. But that doesn't mean you won't be tempted. And that doesn't mean what the rest of the Bible speaks, that he was tempted in all points, like as we, yet without sin. But if, you see, if any man, any Christian contextually sin, don't give up. You're not suddenly not a Christian. If you only read 1 John 3, you're not a Christian. You can't be saved. You sinned. You cannot sin. Yo, if any man, any Christian fail and fall, don't you give up. You get up. You get up. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation that comes from Leviticus that we were speaking about now. The way to God for mercy. He's the mercy seat. For our sins, Christians' sins. Okay? You go to 1 John 5, uh, verse 10, 11, 12. If any man see his brother sin, what do you do? Go and tell the world, oh, what a hypocrite. Would. No, he shall ask. You get down and you cry to God. He shall cry to God. He shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Yeah. So, there's two places. If you sin, it's not the end. If, so you come back and you realize that can't be saying that because it contradicts. So John made it clear that you can sin before you get to 1 John 3. Now you come to predestination. Romans 9. Go, there you are. Wow, what can you say? Go and read it, boy. And before you come and argue with me. In a, 
But then I thought, well, you know, you've got to start with chapter 1, verse 1, before you get to 9. So, wow, chapter 1, for this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For this cause, there's a cause for God to give up a man even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that not convenient, grief, filled with all unrighteousness. So Romans 1, the most fearful chapter in the Bible. But you find out that God tells us that all men are sinners, everyone. And ultimately, for the reason, one, God does seal a man's choice. He gives people up. But it's always for a cause. Always for a cause. Whether it's Pharaoh who hardened his heart five times before God hardened his heart and sealed his choice. Pow! Esau. If I, Jacob, if I loved Esau, if I hated. Go back to Habakkuk where those verses are taken from. All you find. Romans 9, by the way, is just God's answer to Job almost word perfect, the whole of nine, isn't a new concept. Who art thou if, huh, if God wills, who art thou to argue against him? Who, who are you to argue a reason against God's righteousness? Um, so the argument there was taken by Paul, but taken right out of context because they didn't like the idea of reading chapter one, huh, from verse 16 especially where they gave God a reason to be so grieved that he sealed their choice. Before God gives a man up, let me tell you a man, including Pharaoh and Esau. Go to the Old Testament, you'll find the context. There is no such a thing as God giving up anybody. If you really want to see the heart of God and the righteousness of God, Go back to where all these verses, and then also go to the rest of the scriptures. Now, I was asked in Oklahoma City, there's a whole group of preachers from across the town sitting there. And the one woman said to me, Mr. Daniel, there was a question answer also, okay? Uh, are you aware of the reformed movement that's taking over Dividing churches, it used to be the charismatic movement that the churches were split everywhere and everybody had to go to new buildings or hold on. The, just churches divided everywhere across the world. Now it's the reformed movement that is the hyper-Calvinist, okay? Generally. And uh, it's dividing churches, it's dividing families. Do you know the war that's going on out through this doctrine of predestination? of election that has been pushed from the, some of the most renowned preachers in the world. And now it's whole movements whole, are just dividing churches across the world and preachers. Are you aware of that? So I said, well, that's nothing new. <laughs> but I am aware. But she says, Mr. Daniel, give us some explanation. So I did. She says, then I'm challenging you. to take all these answers you've got and to prepare a sermon that will give us an answer that we can take to these people and say, listen to this. And I'm asking you to make it scriptures only, sir. Hmm. So I thought, okay, spent a year. Someone said, how many, how long does it take you to prepare that sermon? Did not a year, I said, 50 years. Fifty years, yes. That's how long it took to get answers. You don't get answers in one moment. It's a lifetime. So, I preach the sermon. And in answer to your question, ultimately, the answer I give this world, I gave in that sermon called Calvinism versus Arminianism. War between the saints. Uh, it's on the internet, uh, on a lot of websites and on uh, YouTube. I speak with authority. 
I can hardly put a computer on. I'm still learning. So don't think it's a great authority. <laughs> and uh, my wife knows. She's, she can do anything. My children, they do everything for us, for me. But I am aware that they have taken that message that I preached in Atlanta. Atlanta. Oh, five, ten years ago, maybe seven, eight. Uh, mostly preachers and some of the most renowned preachers of your country were in that meeting. Both sides, Wesleyan, Arminiast. Wesley took Jacobus, Arminius, the Dutchman, who, by the way, was, we won't tell you what they did to him, uh, because he challenged Calvinism. But on that uh, message I brought in what they did to the man who stood up and said no, like I have. And I took the two, the five points of Arminius that he, that he Wesley of course, took the extreme statements of Arminius, Jacobus Arminius, who was a great theologian. But Wesley put them into perspective where I think the closest you will come to truth is what Wesley ultimately, on that particular doctrine of predestination, so I gave John Calvin's statements and every single scripture of the five points because the five points of Calvinism are a counteraction, a reaction, a response, a defense to the five points of Jacobus Arminius to prove that on every single point of Calvinism there's scriptures that counteract that and put them into perspective. Yes, what I did took 50 years, no, 40 years to learn. I thought, well, if I just stand there and say, I am one side, pow, all the Calvinists will walk out, pow, I've lost them. And the rest will say, hallelujah. If I say I'm a minister, all, uh, all the vice versa, you know, then all the ministers will walk out. So I sat there with a group of all the groups, and I, I sat to preach to them. And I knew it has been watched worldwide on live view, whatever you call it. Um, so I brought all the points, every scripture in the Bible of those points that Calvin says, Sola Scriptura! They used to scream louder than that. Only the scripture! Okay, so the Wesleyans also, from Jacobus, Arminius screaming, Sola Scriptura! And they both had scriptures. So I gave all the points and all the scriptures that both sides of Calvinism versus Arminianism, both sides screaming, only the scripture, not else. So I gave all the scriptures that they were, so I gave both sides and all John Wesley, Jacobus, even John Calvin and uh, Arminius right down, Luther's even and uh, Zwingli, all these people, their statements of what those great men started, of that caused this great division, this war between the saints. And there's never been a war with so many casualties as the war uh, between the saints of Calvinism versus Arminism. Trust me. Anyway, now they both sitting there, I defended that John Calvin would have stood up in his grave. No, that's not the right doctrine. But he would have just said, right. But then I did the same that John Wesley would stand up and say, I couldn't add another word, you know. So anyway, so get both sides. First, Calvinism, you've got to do that or they leave. But second, everything of many is And then the final conclusion, which that you've got to listen to, okay? It took 50 years, 40 years of a lot of weeping, actually. Weeping, yeah. Putting it mildly. And then I ended this sermon. 
And the whole place was in stunned shock that somebody actually brought both sides and nobody's left. And normally they just get up and say, what are you? Because it was the scriptures and historical facts defending. Man, he defended me in a way that I've never been able, never known anybody to defend Calvin. And the same as the Wesleyan Arminius. Okay. So I ended with a lot of saying, I said, I suppose you're all sitting out there wondering, what is this man? What am I? Calvinist or Arminius? What am I? Which view do I hold? You know, the whole congregation, including some famous preachers who are going to hear this, from the whole congregation started going forward. And it's all the more Benny. He's going to tell us what he is. I said, none of your business. <laughs> that's the best thing to do, because they're still confused. And within half an hour, people were phoning from across America and even other countries. They were coming with phones and said, preachers are on their faces and want you to know that while you were preaching, and they were listening to the other side of the world, some of them, and all across America, you see, they went down before God sobbing and asking God for mercy, for closing their eyes to what was in this book that they didn't want because they were biased to the doctrine. Hmm. That they were forced to embrace to be part of the particular movement. Yeah. Is there another question? This will have to be the last one, by the way, because we've gone over time. Last one. You've had enough. I can see that. You can't. You can. That's enough. <laughs> mm, I'm looking at a man called. Remind me, Michael. No. What is your name again? Yeah. Say. Barrett. Barrett. A good man. He cut his hair. Since, <laughs> since I first saw him, and he sat at a table a year ago. And gave me his testimony. And that was a lovely testimony. So, Barrett, you're leaning forward. Have you got a question? I can ask a question. Good. Uh, so there's a lot of young people in our church who are sort of searching and trying to figure out uh, what to do vocationally with our lives. We desire to uh, serve God and please God in the church, to be people of prayer, to be people of the book. But we have a practical life. We have to pay bills. We have to um, provide for families, things like that. And uh, It's hard with so many options and so many different paths we can take. What advice would you give if we're seeking God's will for our lives vocationally or how to spend our days? If you seek guidance, uh, you can get any guidance you want. <laughs> Who to marry? Oh, I've got a scriptures, you know. If you really want to, you can really... Ah, at last I've got a verse that's just telling me what I want to do. You've got to be careful with that. Your safety or God's guidance in your life, where you have no fear, is to stay so close to God and then to seek Him. There's only one way to stay close to God, that you can that he has an obligation to guide you, and that is to be devouring the book daily. That's how much you're close to God. Devouring the book, and as my son Roy would add, but daddy, and doing it, okay? And seeking God for grace to live it. Of course, otherwise you wouldn't be devouring it, and everyone knows that I mean that. But if you are real with God, and you are as real as this book is your life, wherever you have a choice, of time, this you go to. You don't hesitate and think, what should I do? You, that's when you ride with God. You want to know your pulse whether you're right with God. In the old days when they want to know if anything's wrong, you take the pulse. Well, you want to take your pulse in one second. To know where you, you stand with God is this book first. Because then God is first. If it isn't, God isn't. If it's tenth in line to things you choose to do, today with the internet, with the telephone alone, a thousand things can keep you from fleeing to be alone with God. We didn't have these temptations. 
Thank God. I, I wouldn't be stooped to pick up a telephone while someone's speaking to me and rather be looking and not interested in him saying, or a conversation to cut myself with. I'm not interested in these people. I want to go my own thing, you know. Well, that's a rebuke, isn't it? Now, <laughs> intended. <laughs> I got a few things I want to preach one day of the changed world in the church. Wow, from the sluggish, you know, <laughs> while you're preaching. That would be, you would be never allowed back. It was irreverence. I mean, there was an awe of God's sacred word today. Woo! And also, who? Texting each other. Suddenly they're all smiling. <laughs> you know they're all. Huh? In God, I want to tell you, this thing is an addict. You're addicted to it. You can't live without it, and you communicate. And every, even when a conversation is going on, suddenly you realize you could get up and walk from the table. This man wouldn't know. For half an hour, he wouldn't know he's sitting alone. All he's interested in, oh, well, anyway, let's not go to, what am I asking? What, what did you ask me again? <laughs> <laughs> Terrible, but I'm going to preach a sermon on the sluggers. Have you ever tried to preach and suddenly you see bottles going up? <laughs> I said to one man when my son was preaching, who got up about ten times through the sermon, walked right through to get a cup of coffee, walked back and... <laughs> I said, do you know how many cups of coffee you had while my son was preaching? You got up to go... Do you know? Tell me... Do you do that all day? Is it only when God's word is preached that you have to have ten cups of coffee? That you can't survive one hour? Is the whole day you do that? Or just when God's word is preached? Well, I don't know if he ever came near us again. He just started running. He's probably still running. But someone has to say something. So yeah, one day I'm going to preach just before I die. In case they kill me, then at least it's close to death. Now, what was the question? <laughs> Please repeat it. Oh, yes. <laughs> God's will. If you are devouring God's word, not in a strict discipline to say, I've done it, but out of love, because the more you devour the word, the more you love it. The more you give God six verses, that's it. You give God six chapters, whoo. That's different. You'll start saying, whoa, I can't stop. You give God three chapters in the morning. Once a year, you threw the Bible. Pow! You give God six chapters, three chapters of the old, three chapters of the new. You twice through the whole Bible in one year. That's half an hour. Fifteen minutes is all you need for, five, for, for, for three chapters. You give God half an hour in the morning at six chapters. Whoa. Six in the new, half an hour. In 24 hours, you can give God half an hour. You know how many times you can be through this book? And that isn't discipline. That's when this is God is first. And this isn't your God. This is the voice of the God you serve. This is his word. He speaks primarily through this book in every aspect of life, including thy statutes are my counselors. The commandments of God, the words of God, counsel me. They give me and in many counselors, there's safety in many counselors, Proverbs says. And if you get many verses, so yes, we've had crisis after crisis after crisis in life. We all do. And decisions have to be made and things that can really destroy your whole life if you make the wrong decision. And I've had to rely, and I suppose most Christians, on God's guidance of vocation, yeah, if you really are right with God, even to whom you marry, even the choice in your heart's going to this, if you really are right with God and doors are open of all sorts and you're going to make a choice, somehow, circumstances, yes, they have to cry out God's will. And common sense, common sense, common sense that God gave you. Many come to me and say, how do I know if it's God's will to marry this I said, you don't have to ask me 
just use your common sense, man. Hmm. Well, I gave a few other statements, but still, people were telling him who he had to marry, and I said, you don't have to do that. You go, when your heart goes bang, pow, God made you natural. You don't wait for people to tell you to marry and fall in love with, okay? Hmm. But then if God stops you, and he will if you're real with God, somehow God will reveal to you, this is not my will. Now, I guarantee you that. More clearly than I'm speaking to you now, God will speak to you. More clearly. That's God. He doesn't leave us to, to doubt and make disasters. There's a clarity with God's voice that comes, if this book is first, you write with God, and God has a way that if you turn to the left or the right, you will hear a voice behind you saying, Whew, this is the way. Walk ye in it. That's the man soaked in the scriptures. That's the man in touch with God. Outside of that, you're going to make so many errors and blunders, even if you pray for guidance. Because God does not write with his finger on the wall to tell us all what he wants us to hear. He writes in our hearts through this book that we know, mainly through this book, the, the, the guidance of God, the warnings of God, the detraction, the encouragements of God, the confidence God will give you when everything in the world virtually, apart from God, says don't. But God just says do. And there's many things. Common sense tells you what I'm speaking about. <sighs> Stay right with God. You know you're right with God if this book remains first. And the more you give to this book of your day, the more you will want it and bury anything else. The devil won't be able to divert you to anything he can offer on that box or anywhere else. Because there's nothing that excites you more, and that's when you really devour. Mine eyelids prevent the night watches. They want to close, but for the love of thy word, I, I should know I've got to read more. That's when you really give everything you've got. You don't want to stop. I mean, that's when you get through this book a thousand times in your lifetime. And I've known many who can say that. Mm. And God will stop you and say, this is not the right way. Circumstances, common sense, and on occasions, a confirmation of what he's actually saying to you. But the common sense, you don't have to ask God for scriptures before you ask the common sense God gave you and me. To know that's, that's stupid to even think of that. God wouldn't want that. So what do I want scriptures for? But there are times that this holy book will stop you in your tracks. For instance, if you're called to preach or become a missionary or give yourself to God's cause, and bury all your other plans behind, no matter what the consequences. You firstly will lose all interest in everything you've been de desiring. God will take it out of your heart, your ambitions, your ways, your, your career just phew, dies. The more you try and pursue it, if God's called you, that happens, or God hasn't called you. And only if you get back soon will you deny God and reject. You will know, like Jonah, that you're putting your fist up into the sky and saying no to God about what he wants for your life. And God will make you crawl if he loves you, which he does, like he made Jonah crawl for defying his will. Oh, God knows how to do that. But in all honesty, I needed this book. I've got the markings from Bibles upon Bibles that are in tatters that I have to just get new ones, but I couldn't believe the Lord had called me until, well, I knew, I knew, but then all hell tried to stop me, including religious preachers. Whew. One night I went on my face. I was on my face, and I tell you everything, everything. God took my car away. God, I can't tell you what happened to the degree it happened, and I just got on my face and said, no more God. And I opened my Bible and I said, Lord, 
I know you've been speaking to me and I've been fighting you about going into full-time service because everything's crying out to me, even religious people don't. Especially the mission I was going to go to because it was deeply conservative. That God had led me. And I didn't open my Bible particularly for an answer. It was just open while I was on my face. And a tear fell on a verse. And as I wiped away, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it. Hmm. I said, I'm going now, God. I'm going now. The next day, my whole life just said, go. And no matter what people said, no matter what preachers said, no matter what the devil said, no matter who he used, and he uses the most unexpected sources when it means going out into God's will. But I knew it was God. It was the book. I go back to that when all hell comes to destroy me, and I say, God, you... You told me, and I point to the verses God gave me, and verses God gave me about who, confirming with Jenny, my heart, of course, told me, common sense told me, every circumstance told me, but scriptures also, that this is the only woman God would ever let me marry, outside of which I would be in total defiance and destroy my life and ministry if I didn't. This was the only lady that would ever survive me. There you are. And she did, and I would never have survived without Jenny. Most men say their wife needs them, but in all honesty, I needed a wife, and I needed this lady, or I would never have survived. And God knew that, but he confirmed it in the end. In so much, so much of circumstances, common sense, everything, but especially the natural thing, pow, when your heart explodes, that has to happen. God made you that way, otherwise you're a very silly boy. If you look at someone and say, yuck, I don't even like what she looks like. And I've heard preachers say that. And they married the poor woman. <laughs> but it's God's will, you know. No ways. You've got, to, you've got to be normal. Number one, pow! If your heart doesn't explode, there's something radically wrong with you mentally, saying, I want to marry her. <laughs> and number two, if God doesn't stop you, but confirms, confirms. And God has a wonderful way of doing that. Many, it says safety in many counselors. God's word says, and my counselors, thy statutes, O oh God, are my counselors. This. Stay close to God, number one. You hear his voice when you try and go out of his will. And you'll also see everything God just confirming. Your common sense, every circumstance. This is what I want you to do. This is the way. He'll do that more clearly than I am speaking to you now. If you have any doubt, don't. Because when God speaks, brother, you don't have doubt.